Mm. Moving, moving on a little bit to another uh, topic we've we've covered, or like the range of ideas that you've expressed so far in this interview um, are greatly emphasizing the pain-pleasure axis and to an extent different um, expressions of those standard um, human feelings and emotions such as motivation or jealousy um, and which ones would be desirable. But if we look a little bit further into the future, um, there might be lots of other like expressions of, of possible experiences that are completely unexplored so far. Um, something that I, I find actually very admirable of, of your work is that you're not, so to speak, um, enclosed with the belief that the human experience is all there is to, to life. Um, and whereas you have sort of like two general camps um, of people who, who talk about consciousness, you have very, people who are like very sloppy thinking, uh, who say, well, there's like this wide variety of conscious experiences that have different meanings, significance, like spiritual realms, and so on and so forth. You, then you have hard-headed hard academicians who might say, well, all of that is complete fantasy, like what matters is what you can see, what matters is what you normally experience. Um, you, on the other hand, recognize that there's a vastly, a very vast uh, state space of possible experiences that are underexplored, and in particular, you've, you've expressed that uh, psychedelics, for example, um, such as LSD or DMT or salvia, unlock state space of consciousness that, um, that, that, that might potentially, uh, in the future, might be of, of incredible significance. Um, I, I don't know, I would, I would love if you could comment a little bit on, on that general topic. Yes, uh, from a, an ethical perspective, I think our priority lies in phasing out suffering. Uh, now, in terms of knowledge, uh, quite a common criticism is that, well, if we were uh, happy all the time, we wouldn't be motivated uh, by intellectual curiosity, it would bring uh, progress to a juddering halt. On the contrary, one uh, of the many blessings of ensuring the substrates of invincible well-being is that invincible well-being will enable us to explore radically altered states of consciousness without the possibility of so-called bad trips. Because part of the problem today with taking drugs that induce radically altered uh, states of consciousness is that they are unpredictable uh, and one can't in advance make an, an informed choice about what one is letting oneself uh, in for. But in future, as I said, once uh, experience below hedonic zero becomes physiologically impossible, one can be certain that however strange or outlandish or weird these altered state spaces of consciousness uh, are, they will nonetheless be hedonically rich. Um, yes, what we call ordinary waking consciousness, or just most of the time, yes, just consensus reality that is treated as the gold standard for knowledge claims is just one state space amongst many. It seems to have been the one uh, most conducive to helping our genes lead or copies themselves on the African savanna. But if you compare the difference between uh, sleeping consciousness and waking consciousness, it seems to be a, a whole multitude of state spaces uh, that exist that are largely unexplored. In some cases, we aren't even physiologically capable of accessing them. Um, I, yeah, it's perhaps it's worth stressing that I don't think simply taking uh, different drugs offers the royal route to enlightenment, just as someone who's congenitally blind to an operation gives the gift of sight to, and takes them months or even years to be able to navigate state space of visual experience and in the case of someone who's given the gift of sight they they have a pre-digested conceptual scheme of sighted people if one were to take uh, a drug that let's say induces echolocatory experience in the way one might imagine let's say a civilization of hyper-intelligent bats for instance um, 
nonetheless one would be intellectually completely out of one's depth. Um, and this is how I see these altered state spaces, that in many cases they will not have been recruited by natural selection to play any information processing role, not as yet. Um, they are inaccessible to classical digital computers, and even humans who start to explore these states, their significance at first will be completely opaque to us. But uh, just because we won't at first be able to make sense of them doesn't mean to say that they're intellectually unimportant in the same way as uh, a, a tribe of congenitally blind people who try a drug that induces visual experience. Yes, the, the, the drug taker there will be right in divining that this visual experience is significant, even though nothing in his conceptual framework has prepared him for what has been unlocked. So in a nutshell, you're saying um, psychedelic takers are experiencing the phenomenal expression of senses we don't have and are trying to convince us that such thing as uh, intellectually uh, valuable, but we don't really have anything, a way of, of um, harnessing that. Very much so. Uh, it said it's, it's purely a contingent matter that what we call visual experience uh, is for the most part locked on to tracking uh, spectral reflectances as one knows from let's say something like uh, dreaming there is no uh, indissoluble link between uh, stimulation of the, of, of the retina and, and, and visual experience. Visual experience is simply uh, a mode of experience that natural selection has harnessed for information processing purposes. In the case of something like synesthesia, for instance, uh, sight and sound can be transposed. And I would regard a lot of these alien, outlandish state spaces of experience as, yes, no necessary connection between any information processing role. They may or may not one day be uh, recruited uh, uh, for they are potentially at least intrinsically interesting. Okay. Um.